Good morning, congregation, and welcome to Trinity News. I'm your host, Emily Wilson, informing you on all the latest and greatest in Hey Neighbor happenings. Our outreach ministries are continually growing, and if you would like to find out how you can serve this summer, then check it out at trinitybirmingham.com slash serve. Speaking of serving, Element Student Ministries Serve Week is happening July 10th through the 14th. And if you are a rising 6th through 12th grader, then we would love for you to serve with us here locally in Birmingham. For more information, you can check it out at elementstudentministry.com. Well, congregation, that's all I have for you. Be sure to check back next week for the latest and greatest in Hey Neighbor happenings. I'm your host, Emily Wilson, and you've been watching Trinity News. Hey church, and welcome to online worship here at Trinity United Methodist in Birmingham, Alabama. My name is Brian Erickson, and as the senior pastor here at Trinity, it's my great joy to welcome you to worship with us today. Here at Trinity, we believe our calling is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. And a disciple is someone who has experienced God's grace to turn around and share God's grace. A disciple's faith is always a growing faith, and faith only grows in community, in relationship, because we believe that the love of God is bound up in learning to also love our neighbors. And that means we can't do this alone, and we can't do this without you. So I'm so glad you've set aside this time to be with us in worship. As always, click on the link below, and you'll find a chance to not only let us know that you're here, share any prayer concerns, you can even make a financial gift in support of our ministries. But my ultimate prayer is that in this time of worship, you will come face to face with the grace and the mercy of our living God. Let's worship together. Ministries, uh, and I, we're so grateful that you've joined us here in worship today, uh, whether you're here in the sanctuary, online, or listening over the radio. Um, if you're here in the sanctuary, be sure to get the attendance pad that's on the end of your pew, uh, sign it so we will know who's gathered here in worship today, and take a look at the other names so you can get to know the folks around you. Uh, if, you're on, if you're joining us online or on the radio, please go to trinitybirmingham.com or visit the link in the comment section, and there again, you'll be able to register your attendance uh, and as well as give to the ongoing ministries of the church. Today's worship is being broadcast from 9 to 10 a.m. on WAPI 1070 a.m. and 99.5 FM and, and on the iHeartRadio app. And today is sponsored by Marion Wilson and family in memory of Tom Wilson. The flowers on the altar guild were arranged to the glory of God and are in honor of the music staff. Today we uh, continue in our summer series where each of the pastors at Trinity will be preaching and sharing on one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, in each of the worship spaces, both here at our Oxmoor campus and at our Trinity West Homewood campus. Uh, today, Reverend Amy DeWitt uh, will be here in the sanctuary with us. Again, each of the pastors will come to you. You don't have to chase them around to get all ten of the Ten Commandments. You'll, if you stay, come here same time, same back channel, you'll get all ten of the commandments. Um, again, it's so good to see each of you this morning. I want to invite you now to stand, whether in body or spirit, for the chiming of the Trinity, followed by our opening hymn. Um, and I don't have the opening hymn, but <laughs> good morning. Welcome to Trinity.
gone before us and those who will come after us, all professing and affirming a common faith. May we give voice to that faith, faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. We have many people who have made a covenant to pray over the requests that you offer. If you have a prayer need of any kind, we invite you to submit it online or by emailing it to the church office. Our prayer garden is open daily during the week if you would like to come up to the church to pray. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Gracious God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. You know our deepest hopes, fears, and concerns. Even before we utter a word, you are ready to hear us. So we offer our open hearts to you as we come to worship today. We confess that we do not always return your perfect love. Forgive us when we are preoccupied by our own needs when we have neglected the needs of others and have lacked generosity of spirit. Restore us to faithfulness, breathe into us new life, and transform us to be the body of Christ. We give thanks for your goodness and the many gifts you have given us, for occasions to be your hands and feet in the world, for fathers who love us and those we get to love, for those who have been like fathers to us for the provision of all we need to sustain our life, for opportunities to work and to rest. Give us grace to share your good gifts with others. We trust that you are already working for our good and for the good of this world you so love. We praise you, O oh God, for your liberating power that broke shackles of oppression and restored humanity to the disenfranchised Make us instruments of grace to resist slavery in all forms, that no soul shall be denied the right to thrive and fully realize their divine purpose in you. We pray for comfort for those who mourn, especially today for those who have lost fathers or who long to be a father. We also ask that you heal those who are sick, injured, or brokenhearted guide those who need wisdom and direction, restore relationships within families, among friends, and between nations, give assurance to those who feel forgotten and alone. We hold before you this day all who have died from the plague of gun violence in our land, especially those lives lost this week at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. We lift our voices in sorrow, 
knowing that every life is infinitely valuable to you. Receive all who have died into your arms of mercy. Bless those who mourn with the hope of eternal life and strengthen our hearts and our arms to bring an end to this scourge. We pray that you would even make us the answer to our own prayers. Renew in us a commitment to the mission of your church and enable us to be witnesses to your love as we share grace, spread joy, and live in hope. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My name is Brian Erickson, and as senior pastor, it's my great joy to welcome you to worship this morning. I also want to especially acknowledge everything that's going on today. Today, obviously, is Father's Day. We are so grateful for our biological fathers, uh, the men who have raised us and loved us, nurtured and cared for us. But also in the church, we're grateful for our baptismal fathers, uh, the men who step into our lives even though we are not blood, and yet they care for us as if we belong to them because it, according to the waters of our baptism and our covenant vows, we do belong to them. I'm also mindful today is Juneteenth. If you did not grow up in Texas, this might be a new thing for you, but I think particularly for people of faith, there is power in the story of slaves two years after the Emancipation Proclamation finally being freed. That sounds like a gospel story, that we are freed and the world is freed, we just need to be about the business of telling people that they are free. Um, obviously, also, as Lisa mentioned in her prayer today, we gather in the shadow of what's happened to our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends at St. Stephen's Episcopal. Um, I'm mindful that the Spirit binds us together as believers. Every week when we say the Apostles' Creed together, we, we pray for one holy Catholic church. That means that we believe that we are part of one body of Christ together. And so when the hearts of any are broken, the hearts of all are broken. And so um, I'm, I'm especially grateful for the power of gathering today. Um, it, is, it is maybe most especially important that we've come together to be the body of Christ here today. And I'm grateful for your presence with us as we continue to pray for our sisters and brothers at St. Stephen's. I'll, I'll also, I'm also super excited that our youth are about to head off to SOS in Memphis. I want to invite all of y'all quietly and gently to move towards the front of the sanctuary. Uh, we have about 70 uh, young people and adult leaders going with uh, our youth ministry team towards SOS. We haven't been able to do our SOS trip in about three years, and we're so excited uh, to finally be returning. As they come forward, let me share a couple other things with you. We also have a need, continued need for Vacation Bible School volunteers. If you've got some availability for Vacation Bible School, please reach out to Susan at St. John. Next week during the Sunday School Hour, uh, we'll have a representative from Firehouse Ministries down in the F Fellowship Hall sharing about our ministry there. We hope you'll come and join us for that. And if you just look ahead to July 3rd, on July 3rd, because of the holiday weekend, we'll have a combined worship schedule with an 8.30 traditional service and 10.45 contact. We won't have our 11 o'clock uh, traditional service here on this, this campus. Um, as you see uh, these faces of, of these young people and their uh, slightly less young leaders, young at heart, um, I, I want you to be thinking about them not just now, uh, but all this week, because they go forward as our representatives 
as the hands and feet of Christ to do God's work. Um, and folks, I want you to know that my prayer for you is that God is going to mess with you this week. I'm specifically praying for holy interruptions, uh, for God to uh, just completely disturb you in a really wonderful way. Uh, as you see new things, as you experience the power of what it means to be the hands and feet of Christ, and you experience the radical idea that you can change the world. Whenever we get in line with the will of God, we're capable of amazing things. May it be so. Church, will you stand as we pray for these folks? Gracious and holy God, Lord, we send forth our brothers and sisters into service. God, we pray uh, for good work to be done by their hands. But Lord, especially we pray for tender hearts. Uh, God, I pray uh, for the student who's going on this trip that's not even sure why they're going. May their parents force them to go. Um, God, I, just, I pray that they would experience something they're not expecting. We know, Lord, that uh, you believe in retreat, that you stepped away from the routine and the rhythm of daily life, that you could hear the voice of your Heavenly Father more clearly. May it be so for each of them, that, that even in the heat of a Memphis roof, uh, they might experience the power and the fire of your Holy Spirit. Give them safety, um, give them sensitivity, and Lord, help them to shine forth with the best of what it means to be the body of Christ. We pray for them in the mighty and matchless name of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Since you're standing, as you all return to your seats, turn and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Good morning again, Debbie. Good morning, lovely people. Good job, good job. morning we remember how dependent we are on your love and mercy for every good and helpful thing in our lives we affirm in our giving that all the money and possessions in the world cannot rescue us from the demons that torment and tug us at every day when we've tried to fix things on our own we have failed when we put our trust in your loving power made known to us in Christ we have found our lifeline dedicate these gifts and our lives that we might not only find our way, but lead others towards Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
remain standing as we give honor to the reading of God's Word today from the book of Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female slave, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Adults, you may be seated as our kids come forward now for our children's time with Miss Susan. this morning good I am so so glad to be with you this morning remember during the summer we've been talking about the Ten Commandments right and we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments all summer can anyone take a guess on which commandment Pastor Amy's going to preach on today just a guess ten good guess anybody else pick a number any number one through ten it's number eight It's number two today, commandment number two. Good guesses. So let's look at our blessings, Will, and point to the number two, and we'll see what our second commandment is. Can you read that? Do you know what that says? No. No idols. No idols. Okay. And if you didn't make your blessings wheel last week, there are plenty back in the back in the kids' corner, okay? So you can make one of these so we can keep up with what the pastors are preaching on. So our second commandment says, you shall not make for yourself an idol. No idols. Well, that got me thinking about this awesome animal I made out of Play-Doh. Can everybody see my animal that I made? He's smiling at you, Price. Do you see this animal that I made out of Play-Doh? Well, his name is Agamemnon. I decided to name him Agamemnon. No historical reference, adults. And I think I'm going to start talking to him every night and praying to Agamemnon. I'll say, Dear Aggie, thanks so much for creating this beautiful summer day. And thank you for all my friends, and please keep me healthy and safe. I love you, Agamemnon. Amen. Does that sound right? Hmm, no. Wait a minute. Can my Play-Doh idol, Agamemnon, do any of those things that I prayed to him about? Can he create, did he create this beautiful summer day? No. Can this hunk of Play-Doh keep me safe and healthy? No. No, No, of course not. Well, we certainly don't want anything like this silly little Play-Doh guy to stand in our way of praying and being close to God, do we? We don't want anything like that because God is so big, way bigger than my little friend here, much bigger than this silly old hunk of Play-Doh. God knows and sees everything and is constantly loving us and caring for us and looking after us. And I don't think Agamemnon can do that. So my challenge for you this week is to look for things that might be standing in your way of being close to God. Things that may be taking your focus away from God. So let's have a prayer about that, okay? Dear God, thank you for showing us your great love. We are so blessed by you that we don't need idols or anything else but you. You are all that we need, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, you guys can have a seat.
are continuing our summer sermon series all about the Ten Commandments, looking at a different commandment each week. And I have to tell you, I have become fascinated with the significance of the commandments, especially to the community who first received them and then every generation thereafter. You, you know by now that we find the Ten Commandments in two places in the Old Testament. The first time is in Exodus, after God has delivered the people uh, from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt, and Moses leads them into freedom. Then, then Moses meets God up on that mountain, and he sees God in this bur- bush that burns, but is not consumed. He, he doesn't actually see God face to face, but he hears God's voice. And there at the mountain, the people receive those Ten Commandments, Ten Ground Rules, as if God is saying, you don't have slave masters telling you what to do with every second of your day anymore, so this is how I want you to be together. This is how I want us to be together. And God inscribes those words on stone for posterity. This is how God defined what it was to be an Israelite, to be one of the chosen people, to live together in community with God and with each other. And they carried those stones with them everywhere they went through the wilderness until they reached the promised land. And it was at the brink of finally arriving at that place that God had prepared for them that we find the commandments again in Deuteronomy. So this is how they would set up house in the promised land. This is how they agreed they would be together with God. And in a way, it is so appropriate for us to be talking about the Ten Commandments as we also uh, recognize Juneteenth and celebrate the end of slavery in our own country. Because today we also recognize and confess that we still have a long way to go toward the promised land, toward the end of oppression and flourishing of everyone, and we need God's guidance. We need God to show us the way to live with each other. Because the truth is God's guidance, God's boundaries form our community. It's the way you say, in our house, we want to talk with each other during dinner, so our rule is no devices at the dinner table. Or it's the way you you reach out to your family before Thanksgiving and you say, hey, this year, can we just can we just say together we are not going to talk about politics at Thanksgiving dinner. Can we just agree on that together? Those kind of commitments, they shape the community that you're in. So I've been reading about about just that, about how the commandments were formative for the identity of the Israelites and for the identity of Jewish people ever since, which is why I think this image really got to me. Earlier this month, I got to go with our youth choir. Some of them are here um, in the congregation today on their annual choir tour. We went to Washington, D.C., and one of the places we visited was the Holocaust Museum. Some of you have been there. We learned that there was one particular night, I didn't know this detail of the story, there was one particular night when Nazis destroyed synagogues. They destroyed Jewish houses of worship in various cities throughout Europe, and they called it the night of broken glass. Everything was torn apart. And one of the things they did was to tear up the Torah from inside the space of worship. They they tore up the scroll of the Hebrew Bible, which contains the commandments. They literally tore the scrolls and threw them out into the streets. These fragments that you see were collected from the streets after the synagogues were torn down. That was a particularly heinous way to persecute the Jewish people. Defacing the Torah was an affront to their identity because the words of that Torah, the message and the story it contained, it made them who they were. And I want us to see this summer that in a similar way, the Ten Commandments provide the beginning of what shapes our community, too. So by now, you know that the preachers are rotating around, talking about a different commandment each 
week, so you won't hear the commandments in order, maybe the way you learned them in Sunday school. And that may not matter so much. It may not matter so much that you hear the commandments in order, but it's kind of a shame for the case for today, because I'm here to talk about the second commandment, as Miss Susan said, and, and the second commandment really follows out of the first. The first commandment says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And you'll hear more about that in another sermon. But essentially, it's setting the stage for why these commitments matter. They're not just arbitrary rules of a God who wants to test his people to see if they will measure up. God is saying, I am your God. I went all the way to Egypt to rescue you and prove it, and I want us to be exclusive. I'm the one who saved you, so whatever other gods you might think are out there, whatever other gods other people worship, I want you to leave them behind. I will be my, your God. If you will be my people, you shall have no other gods before me. And I think we usually think about that commandment in terms of things in our life that we tend to make more important than God, things we spend our time and our money and give our attention to more than we give to God. Sometimes we even call those things idols. I actually think in the case for the Israelites, God was talking about actual other gods that people in other cultures worshipped. Even some Israelites worshipped at the time. Gods they had given names to and personality and power to. And so maybe that's not your temptation. Maybe that is not something that pulls your attention away. Maybe you're saying you have no inclination to worship some other culture's deity, and that's great. But if we think about the first commandment talking about those little g gods, the little things we put in place or put above God, then the second commandment may sound a little redundant. The second commandment says, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven or on earth, beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And it goes on to say, this is one of the commandments that has a little bit more of an explanation. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The word for idol here, it means simply image. You shouldn't make an image, a, a likeness, a representation of anything and worship that thing. And again, in that case, this may sound like one of the easy ones. Don't murder, check. Don't make a little uh, Plato Agamemnon and worship it, check, right? But when you know what this meant to the Israelites, what was happening that made this commandment make the list, made it make the Big Ten, you can see why we might need to hear this commandment out too. The Israelites and other people at the time, they made these statues to use in worship and in their homes. And while that may have just started as an aid to focus the people's attention, to set their mind on God, eventually they began associating those figures with divine power. Eventually they started to worship the statues, the, the images, the idols. And again, I hear you, you may think, well, I, I, would never, I would never do that. This is just not a temptation for me. This is an easy one. It's not like you have like a painting or a figure of Jesus in your house and you worship the art, e even if you have art that represents Jesus in your home, you know that it's just a representation, right? It's just a reminder, a symbol of the real thing. But if you sit with this commandment for just a minute, you start to think and ask yourself if there are things, if there are images or symbols or anything we use in worship that's supposed to point us to God, but we've given them more power than they should have. We uh, took the choir tour to Washington, D.C., and that's a place that is full of imagery and symbolism, both sacred and national. And I found myself so deeply moved by some of the images and the art we saw there. 
The students got to sing at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. So this is the part of the sermon where I went on a trip and now you have to see the pictures that I brought home from the trip. The Basilica looks like this. It is massive and it is a gorgeous place of worship where the walls are covered in mosaic depicting scenes from the scripture, depicting the relationship between God and God's people. It is impressive. And it is powerful, and it can even be overwhelming to be in a place like this. People make pilgrimage from there, there from all over the world so that they can worship in this sacred place. And it's easy to imagine how you could get so caught up in the grandeur of the place and the spirit of God that moves through the place that you might even ascribe to the figures and the art and the place itself. You might even ascribe to those things the power of God. In fact, while we were there, we witnessed this woman who, uh, who must have been there on pilgrimage, and she was so moved by a marble figure of Mary holding Jesus' body that she went up so close to it and reached out her hands toward it so much so that she almost was cradling Jesus' face. You're not supposed to touch the statues of the basilica, but she almost said she couldn't help herself. This is the kind of thing that makes me ask the question, are there things, are there images or symbols we use in worship that are designed to point us to God, but we end up elevating in the place of God or even higher than God? And what are other images or symbols that we give that kind of power. I was standing with some of the students at the top of the hill in Arlington National Cemetery, overlooking the city of DC, overlooking the entire cemetery. And up there on the hill, there's a tall flagpole. One of the staff who was there when they found out that um, our students were singers, were musicians, asked if they would sing the national anthem. And so they did, in parts. Our students are amazing. And everyone who was there got quiet and still as they were singing. And the, they turned toward the flag up there at the top of the hill. And, and the tour guide told us that that particular flag on the top of the hill, it stays at half staff most of the time, almost every day, because almost every day there's a memorial at the cemetery, sometimes several a day. But every single night, that flag is respectfully taken down. That much I knew. Every single night, that, that flag is respectfully taken down. And this is the reason why our tour guide gave that that, that is the thing. I've never heard it put quite this way before. He said, the flag comes down because the sun never sets on freedom. Sun never sets on freedom. I got chills. Our world is full of images and figures and metaphors and sim symbols that point us beyond ourselves, that call us to something bigger than ourselves. And the second commandment, it warns us not to give those symbols, especially the things that are supposed to point us to God, not to give those man-made things more power over us than God, not to let them outweigh God. And by now, I hear you, you're saying, I get it, I'm, I'm totally with you, but I don't really see this being my temptation. I'm not bowing down and worshiping the, the cross or the, the paschal candle or the altar. They are just things, and I get that. Maybe preacher types are more susceptible to elevating the things of worship and the practices of worship higher than we should. We get all caught up in things like liturgical colors and where we should put the baptismal font and the correct order of worship. And the truth is all of that stuff is way less important than the actual experience of worshiping God, of being in the presence of God in this place. Why? Because all of the stuff we make, all of the things we make with our own hands. They're made to represent God, but 
all of it pales in comparison to the real thing. The whole point of the second commandment is that the images and the symbols we associate with God are not actually God. And in fact, the things we use to approximate God, even the things we hope will help us get closer to God, are not God. Our, our favorite worship style is not God. This gorgeous building we are sitting in is not God. Your way of interpreting scripture is not God. That thing we've done now for three weeks in a row, so we're going to call it a tradition, that's not God. Even the Bible is not God. They are things. They are things we have made in all sincerity and devotion and desire to see God more clearly and follow God more nearly. But they are not God. Anything we try to make in God's image simply is not God. God. But you know what? There is something God made in God's image, a, a better and more valuable representation of God than anything we could form with our own hands. God showed us something of God's likeness when God created humanity. And when you think about it that way, maybe this is a commandment we need to remember again. Maybe this is not one that is so easily checked off the list, because it insists that we do not elevate any image we've made, any symbol or tradition or metaphor or likeness or favorite hymn or sincerely held argument, as beloved as they may be. It insists that we do not hold any of those things above people, people who were created in the very image of God. This matters. We've come to worship today just a couple of days after a terrible event in our community. We come today in grief and frustration and anger at the senseless loss of life at our neighbor church, St. Stephen's Episcopal. And if you're like me, one of the ways you start to process that is you ask all the questions. Who could do such a thing? Are we ever safe when we gather anywhere? Why does this keep happening? As far as I know, we don't know the motive that led to this tragedy. We may never know. We may never make, it make sense. Except to say that Somewhere along the way, there was something, an idea or a grudge or an argument or a delusion, something that became more important to this man than the living, breathing images of God who sat there having dinner in their fellowship hall Thursday night. Something became more important to him than the lives of fellow human beings. We weep with our sisters and brothers at St. Stephen's who weep today. <clears throat> and as we mourn, as we try to make sense, as we process what we have witnessed, we honor the image of God that graced this world in Bart and Sarah and Jane. We listen to the stories that God wove through their lives. And <clears throat> we honor the ways that they showed the world a little glimpse of who God is. We honor the image of God in them. Because nothing matters more than people God so loved. God so loved that he sent Jesus, the best image of the invisible God, all the way to earth so that we could be redeemed. The second commandment begs us to check ourselves any time we hold something over the love that we could show a human being. Because in God's infinite wisdom, God chose to show himself in the likeness of people, in the form of each other. And nothing matters more. 
to close our service of worship <clears throat> this morning, I invite you to stand and to sing with me, O God who shaped creation. We'll sing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5 together. Let's stand. everyone we meet. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. 